So the first couple of things I'd like to talk about um, today, my talk is developing and delivering. That's my hashtag. Uh, that's the hashtag for today, and that is my um, Twitter thing. Um, so you can heckle uh, offline or online. In fact, I encourage people to talk. I was going to go second today, so I thought it'd be a bit more rowdy, but uh, we'll see how it goes so far. Um, so first of all, um, that's that, that's that. And here's my first slide. Oh, brilliant. That's the v &A. Isn't it great? Uh, this is in South Kensington. It, for you lot, uh, the Natural History Museum and the Science Museum are much more interesting. Um, um, that's it. So, uh, setting the scene, uh, we're talking about a small in-house team of two developers and one technical manager in an organisation with a staff of hundreds. Um, over the past few, three years, well, I totally outnumbered. Um, over the past three years, we've been striving to improve and increase the V&A's web presence. Um, I expect many of you will have small, worked in small in-house teams or uh, pitched for work at a large institution like mine. Has anybody pitched for work at the V&A? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Has anybody pitched and not won work at the V&A? I'm sorry. Um, anyway, um, and hopefully this evening there'll be some insight or empathy or schadenfreude uh, to be had. And if you're completely bored, I should have some nice images for you to look at. Um, right, hand it up. Let's have a look. A couple of disclaimers. Um, first, I'm describing my experience as a web developer rather than the official views of my employer. And uh, second, when I talk about standards here, I have to admit it's uh, more of a, an ambition than something that's always achieved. So considering the term delivering in the talk title, I'd better outline what we think we've achieved at this point and delivered in the past few years. Um, I think the main pieces would be the V&A's collection search <coughs> and API in um, 2009, and earlier this year, the relaunch of the Behemoth V&A website. And the conclusions uh, I draw uh, from the next few minutes are derived from my time at the V&A and uh, experience as an agency developer before that. Simon here. Oh, never mind. Um, but for all that, um, you're not going to get away without a little bit of history. Um, what's in the V&A? Well, we're a museum of the applied arts, and the best way to illustrate this is to talk about an object. And one exhibit that impresses visitors is uh, Trajan's Column. And um, before getting into the nitty gritty, um, I'll tell you a bit about this fabulous object. So this is a photograph in the V&A collections, uh, taken in the mid-19th century by a chap called Francis Frick. Frith. Frith. Uh, it shows Trajan's Column in the uh, Empress Forum in Rome, and this was erected about 100 AD. Um, about the same time as this photo was taken, a certain Monsieur Oudry in Paris made a plaster cast of the entire column um, at the behest of Napoleon III, such was uh, European 19th century exuberance. The V&A bought the cast for £301, 15 shillings and tuppence, and now all 35 metres of it, 110 feet, stand uh, in the V&A's cast courts, sliced in two, and this is a, a fabulous space filled with colossal plaster casts from the same era, or at least made in the same era. Um, so Trajan's column depicts scenes from the Roman emperor's campaigns carved in a helix around the column. And these casts may seem like excesses from a bygone age, but the ravages of time, um, weather, pollution, have uh, degraded the details on the true column in Rome, whereas the column here in the V&A retains the same accuracy as it had 150 years ago. How was that? Is that all right? Good. Very interesting. Okay. But back, back to work. Um, so working in a museum is a compelling task because you have content that people actually want to see and a website uh, that people will visit in numbers. Uh, we're not talking about um, massive scaling issues like Twitter or Tumblr, but um, we do have unique visitor numbers um, in the millions per year, and uh, this will let you know if your infrastructure is not up to snuff. Um, it's also a diverse range of visitors uh, with differing needs and abilities. So one drawback of working in a large public institution is that your audience is split in two, uh, by which I mean you have two audiences one internal and one external. And sometimes the senior employees of the audiences uh, of the, of the organisation have a stronger 
uh, point of view than our visitors. And that's not to say it's malicious. I believe uh, the sort of heads of the department have the, the, the visitors' best interests at heart. It's just that not everyone in an, in an organization of that size is fully qualified to dictate how those users' needs should be fulfilled on the web. And they certainly shouldn't override evidence that we get direct from the visitor. So this is a little slide I chose to illustrate this. Um, any German speakers in the house? Well, excuse me while I mangle this. Um an die Kelle zu kommen, muss man gegen den Strom schwimmen. Which means, uh, to reach the source, one must swim against the tide. I'm sure that's appropriate. So, let's talk about uh, being a web developer in a big institution, um, in the digital de media department at the V&A. Um, I mean, this could probably apply to any web developer, to be honest. Um, web development, <coughs> excuse me, ooh, Guinness. Um, <laughs> ah, I've never done a talk with beer before, it's great. Um, well, it's great for me, it's probably rubbish for you. <laughs> so, uh, web development, in effect, covers a multitude of sins. It is a many-headed beast. Actually, that's a bit dark. That's, a, that's supposed to be a hydra and Hercules is slaying it, but you can only see one head, and it just looks like a bit of an Alsatian. Um, <laughs> So, as you all know, the first priority of a web developer is to avoid being given <coughs> spreadsheets by non-technical colleagues, um, or civilians, as Joel Spolsky calls them. And the rest of it is a combination of jobs, including the following. And this is a bit like a, a, a list blog post. Uh, so, here we go. Systems administrator. So, you're compiling, installing, maintaining, testing software. Database administrator. Being aware of good information design, when to normalize, denormalizing, indexing, etc. High-level programmer, of course, um, using scripting languages to interpret HTTP requests and provide exciting responses for our users. Network administrator, understanding DNS, when your client's uh, website will move on to the new server. Ports, firewalls, the lot. You have to be a bit of a web designer. There's always a bit more interaction design needed than is ever described in the comps. Um, you have to be a multimedia artist, video and audio editor. Finally, you need to be a lawyer. <clears throat> Uh, understanding how best to implement or ignore EU cookie laws um, and the obligations of your institution towards accessibility, oh, data protection, and the like. So it's quite a big job, isn't it? I mean, it's more of a syndrome, um, or as I would say politely, a foster clock. Um, <laughs> but, but, but it's a job we love, right? We wouldn't entrust any of those tasks to anybody else. I think the overview of the stack from the database out to the user back again is one of the greatest strengths of the web developer and it's a, a nice kind of end-to-end -end programming. So I'm not really sure what this slide presents but it was a nice drawing. Um, I, th I, think I, talk, I think I talk about performance at the end so that's supposed to be like a fast car or something. How's the levels on this microphone? Does it come in and out? Is it all right? Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, I'm sure you guys have discussed this before, but when I talk about web standards, I'm not just referring to long HTML and CSS documentation on w3.org uh, and what WG, um, although they are key. Uh, I'm also thinking about programming best practice, reusable code, testing, deployment, privacy, security, performance. And with Google ranking taking page speed into account, performance <laughs> is an important part of the user experience, server side and client side up there in the end. So, you'd think that advocating for web standards in a public sector institution would be easier than elsewhere, right? Well, advocating standards in the museum, even where accessibility is concerned, is just as difficult as I found it when making the case to clients in the private sector. In fact, it's often a bit worse because museums are very hierarchical. So, the relationship with you and your colleagues is more, can you just do this quickly, rather than, what's the best way of doing this? And under these circumstances, sticking to standards is not just the right thing to do because it benefits the user. Crucially, observing best practice is beneficial in terms of maintaining your apps, and using standards in a way is an act of self-defense. So what practices did we use to ensure high standards in the V&A? Let's take something absolutely central to the museum, and that is its collections data and how it is managed. Digital Einstein, geeks behold. Um, this is great. Uh, 
<laughs> Sorry, Dave. Um, I'll, get, I'll get there. All right, nine minutes. Whew. Gosh, you have had that chilly dog. <clears throat> Public institutions tend to like buying proprietary off-the-shelf software or solutions, as they're called, uh, for specific tasks. It's a no-brainer. Um, you don't have any in-house development costs, and supposedly support is outsourced. But what happens is your in-house team fills the gap when paid support isn't up to scratch. And worst case, you get miserable end users with crippling management overheads, despite expensive licensing costs. Open source for the win. In the museum, we have a proprietary collections management system, uh, which is ideal to a certain extent for the registrars in the museum. These are the kind of data entry people who input data when they are cataloging <coughs> new objects. And you know the type of interface is a sort of uh, .NET, C sharp, form fields for images and text, and really rather soul destroying. And you know, it's all backed up and put in the museum infrastructure and stored away. It's lovely. And it's fine, but it's not for the web. Um, for example, here's an example of a GUI for a CMS we used to use WTF. So, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, now, this, now, to be fair, we didn't roll this out to the content editors, but um, it's a kind of XSL-driven thing with an ASP. Um, oh, actually, it was, Java, it was JSP, I think. I mean, God knows what it was. It was rubbish. Um, so, but the idea is that you write um, XSL to process stuff that comes out of a Microsoft SQL Server database, and, and this thing is supposed to represent, like, that's the database, right? This is like a select in SQL, and then this thing like here is the template. It's, it's, just, it's just wonderful, isn't it? I mean, it's, oh dear. Um, <laughs> so, what happens is the vendor thinks in an application like this, ah, oh, we better do from the, something for this web thing. We've been in the business for 20 years. So they take a desktop application and they, they slap an ASP or a JSP front end on it. And um, truth is, you know, if you want to deliver a web application of any worth, you build it from the ground up based on web technologies, right? It should never be an afterthought. Uh, your in-house data entry staff typing into a Windows GUI expects a completely different experience from somebody who is uh, on the web and is accustomed to using rich internet applications that actually work. And vendors have an uncanny ability to carry over the worst idioms from the desktop to a web interface. So, modern web technologies modern web designs for web applications because, folks, the last great thing written in C was Schubert's Ninth Symphony. <laughs> Previously, with an old proprietary system, the v &A had about 40,000 objects online and they were carefully and cautiously edited and revealed to the public um, when they were ready. And, um, Later, with a new impetus from the director, the museum wanted everything online, high-res images, warts and all. Um, besides, as people may have remarked, the public had already paid for this to be photographed and researched, so the public should be able to retrieve that info in any way that suits them, right? So, what was the standards-driven tech we used to get over one million objects and a quarter of a million images online onto the internet? Don't worry, that's okay. It's, it's not going to be a frameworks yawn fest. Um, in our case, whilst the collections management service vendor <coughs> tried to implement a new web front end in the way I previously described for our collections data mouse, uh, data mouse, data mouse, danger mouse. Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> cripes, chief. Um, we, we set about modeling the data ourselves using the Python MVC development framework known as Django. Hurrah. Um, and we could have done something similar in PHP with Symfony or Zen framework with Doctrine, but we all turned out to be Python fanboys. But, you know, that's the last you'll hear of, of uh, my partisanship. Right now, I'm more interested in modularity and, and good application design than arguing about program languages, but Python does rock. Um, <laughs> Thinking about MVC, Model View Controller, it encourages the separation of business logic, presentation, and the handling of the HTTP request. And this is best practice for creating extendable, modular, and maintainable web apps, at least in my office. Um, and then we extended the mo application's modularity to the absolute brink of plausibility, um, because we really wanted to build a collections data API that other people could use. 
and we wanted geeks and enthusiasts to build their own mishmashes consuming our machine readable data in JSONP, XML, CSV, tab separated, anything. Uh, so we decided to try and eat our own dog food. There's a dog. <laughs> Not strictly dog food. Um, so although Django has a templating layer, um, I, you see what I'm doing here is I'm exposing the, the, the sort of thought process of the presenter and, and laying it on the line is kind of for comic effect. Never, never give away your secrets. So although Django has a templating layer which can be used for populating HTML templates, we build a, a separate app on a different web server to consume the API data. And we build that out in Symfony, a PHP framework. So this will seem a little convoluted, right? But here's the reasoning behind it. And look, there's the website, yay. Um, see, the thing is, in a museum, you've got to try and keep your stuff loosely coupled and swappable so that when staffing expands or contracts, um, you can assign different pieces of work to different people. Now, it was thought that the PHP front end would need more constant attention, and it would be easier to find a PHP contractor, should they fire me, um, <laughs> than a Django contractor to make those changes. Um, and these are the kind of decisions that you have to make in a public sector. And you can also see it as a kind of thought experiment. So that when we're building the API, um, we could take no shortcuts in the API design in order to just get the pages to work. Um, and it kept us honest. If we can use our API, anyone can. So here is our own API mashup. Um, it's Search Collections, our website. Now, this incorporates the Museum of Childhood's Objects. And if you notice, here on the right, you've got Castle Grayskull, Skeletor, Battle Cat, and He-Man next to a rather dull portrait miniature. Lovely juxtaposition. This is a thrilling slide. Now, I think in the documentation, it's described as a restful API, but it doesn't really implement REST in all its glory. It is inspired by REST, and it fully implements the most important REST principle. That is, not being so poor XML RPC. <laughs> so, so the priority is ease of use, so the URL is predictable, and the parameters are readable, and there are no API keys. And the reason for this is the burden of maintaining and authenticating users was not something we could sustain. I mean, at the time, you were looking at OAuth version 1, which is a royal pain in the ass to implement as a client, so I wasn't going to write a server in it. And even if we did gather details on the API, beyond the server logs that we do use, and we monitored for people abusing the service, we wouldn't really have the resource in-house to deal with or analyze any of that data. So we built separate instances of database and application and plugged them on the internet. If the API service gets hammered, the main website on the previous slide stays up. So, an easy to use, reliable, fast, JSONP API, inspired by REST, please don't break it. Um, and now there are free apps for Android and iOS made by enthusiasts using our data. So that's about as good a technology project as you could hope to work on in a museum, or even public sector, in that it went okay. Do you have any sense of butt coming, don't you? Um, well, well, we'll see about that. Now, moving on to the main website, where you have interpretive material, <coughs> marketing information, and up-to-date listings, uh, you have a different problem. Now, all the departments, everyone will have a say in your website. But referring back to standards, here's what we <coughs> delivered. So we use the HTML5 doc type, yay, and we take advantage of certain HTML5 APIs, like video and audio tags. We also use a bit of CSS border radius here and there, it's not rocket surgery. It's not going to change the world. So enough of these boring screen grabs. Who likes browser stats? <laughs> Yay. I made this graph. Look at it. Ooh, hey, graph can read it and all. This is great. So, so we're just looking at the change in operating systems, uh, visiting the VNA website or sites um, over the past three years. Um, this is great news. Windows has dropped to under two-thirds from 85%. And if you look at Apple's iOS and Mac OS X, you combine them together, they now account for over a third of our visitors. And that's a growth of 130%, which is a good and a bad thing. The red line at the top is Android, and other is, is at the top. There's a yellow Linux line in the middle that has declined somewhat. But as you can see, 
now we've got we've got like at least a third of the people visiting our our website have got um, you know some taste. <laughs> so <laughs> boo hiss, boo hiss. I'm not a Mac fanboy or anything like that. It's, yeah, I'm including Android and Linux in there. Um, so okay, so that's uh, that's operating systems. Now, if you consider our designy, trendy, media type audience, it's no wonder all the Apple stuff's up there. Um, and I expect that many insurance companies would tell a different story. So, in terms of browsers, yeah, now do you like that blue line or what? Um, guess what that is? So, in terms of browsers, we're quite lucky at the VNA. Internet Explorer is, is still our biggest individual browser, but it accounts for about a third of our traffic. 24% of our traffic comes from Safari, and 21%-ish uh, is Firefox. 70% um, is Chrome, which is really ramping up quite nicely. Firefox peaked in about 2009, for about 27%, and really um, Chrome has been cannibalizing a lot of both um, um, Firefox and Internet Explorer. The, uh, I guess the interesting stuff here is that the Safari figures include iOS devices, um, and there's another figure here, this 3.8%, which is also growing, does include um, your Android browser as well. So, good times. So, it makes a pretty good news story for us developers, right? You know. Um, However, although about two-thirds of our audiences are using modern, standards-compliant browsers, about 100% of the internal staff are using IE less than or equal to 8. <coughs> and this is how it makes me feel. <laughs> and this, this is exacerbated even further when you have a version of IE that, in the case of most of the directors of the museum, has happened to find itself to be in compatibility mode. And as you know, compatibility mode makes IE8 behave like IE7. Well, it actually makes IE8 behave like a dick. But that does not excuse, however, failing to test the website properly in IE6 and IE7. But these oversights can happen in the heat of battle during a large project with many stakeholders. There's a battle there. It's not just like a black blob. <laughs> that, that white stuff is like smoke of people getting shot, and there's a horse falling over. It's very tragic. Um, so you can, lose, you can really lose sight of the fundamental principles like progressive enhancement and accessibility when you're under the pressure to build more and more features. And when you're programming, you can mitigate these errors with continuous integration and code review and testing. But it's very hard to do the same thing with human behavior. It's from these, uh, these organizational challenges that a lot of the problems stem. So I think it's a case of, of taking a step back, even at busy times, like, uh, like this fellow's doing here with his sheep somewhere in Surrey. Um, and it, taking a step back to make sure that all the players in the project are moving in the same directions and achieving a baseline of standards. Are the principles which have been agreed at the start of the project still being adhered to? Did you agree any principles at the start of the project? But perhaps, perhaps you pause when you're the most frantic because that's the time when you make the most mistakes. So I think I'd like to take a crude analogy from my own experience. I, I can be banging my head against a programming problem um, for hours and hours on end or an unresponsive server or something like that. And just knowing that if I, if I took a break, I'd, the idea would come to me, you know, what the hell's wrong with this code? What the hell's wrong with this server? Until, you know, nature forces you to, to make that break. And I think it's in that, that voyage and that journey to the lavatory that, <laughs> that you really discover what's going on and, and you can return to your desk quite triumphant. <coughs> But it's quite hard to expect high standards in another list. HTML, CSS, accessibility, usability, design, security, privacy, and performance if you cannot guarantee standards in human interactions and behavior. Here's some people having a fight. I think there's a need for this sort of continuous integration of the human application. So how do you defend yourself against making mistakes when things come to a head? This is the bit where you get my sage advice. A lot of the time, it boils down to making the right technological choices up front. Without going further into the specifics, the patterns that these technologies share are modularity, that word again, good structures, and they are tools that allow you to be agile. Now, 
Agile is a loaded word, and the discipline of extreme programming and the Agile methodology can help you, but uh, non-technical colleagues, civilians again, need to understand and cooperate with this. I mean, you can talk about having a coding sprint, but that's next to impossible in a museum because of the constant interruptions from somebody who wants to talk about a page that somebody important must have online, like yesterday. A better analogy for coding in small dev teams in large public institutions is that of a round of golf, not a sprint. It's a round of golf with a colleague during which you're ambling around a reasonably pleasant environment next to a motorway and occasionally hitting the ball, but most of the time you end up talking about business that you're not particularly interested in. But you can get somewhere. So we've reached agreements with some colleagues that we can ring fence several hours in a day during busy times which most people agree there are no interruptions. This, might, this message doesn't get to anyone, but usually they leave us alone. And I think times of quiet like this are fundamentally necessary for anybody at the production end of the business. This brings us on to the zone. It can take two hours to get there and about 30 seconds to drop out. There's this scene in that Facebook movie where there's this developer with his cans on and he's um, typing away, coding away. Somebody comes in and tries to interact with this developer, and Justin Timberlake leaps across the way and says, no, don't, he's in the zone. And, you know, in my dreams, I have Justin Timberlake just outside my office doing the same job for me. <laughs> now, most people don't have a zone. They can waste two hours booking meetings or updating spreadsheets or watching repeats on TV. Creative people, and that includes developers and designers, they need to sacrifice a frustrating hour or two to get to a place where we can achieve the best we can deliver. And everybody else needs to give us the space to do that. But do ask them nicely. Testing. And you can keep your code tested and releasable at the end of every day. As about as much testing as you can muster. And a little bit can go a long way. The baseline for me is learn the testing suite for your app, load it with some test data, Build a list of the key URLs in your web app, run your test suite, and make sure none of those URLs are 500s after you've edited a piece of code. And that catches like 90% of the fuck ups, to be honest with you. And it gives you a surprising amount of confidence. Bleep that for my mum. The alternative, of course, is. <laughs> I like that cat. <laughs> You see, I, I need to get some, I need to use an internet meme to make you believe that I'm a real developer. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing, testing again, stress test your designs and CSS. Everything looks great in a comp. But what if somebody puts in a long title? And what if there's more than one paragraph or more than three images? And what if there are more images than text? <coughs> your design needs to scale as much as your infrastructure. Work with designers who can also build with HTML and CSS. Don't necessarily ask designers to build, but it helps for them to have that understanding. Drawing rounded rectangles and gradients in Photoshop is not web design in 2011. Apologies. This is my second slide that refers to castration. Anybody would think I have a problem. It's actually a poster for a Bertolt Brecht play uh, in Germany, and in which the uh, one of the main protagonists gets, uh, gets castrated. Um, that's my kind of theatre. <laughs> what I'm actually referring to here is don't virtualise your database servers. It can be very restrictive. Don't virtualise anything at all unless you really need to. Anything that demands disk I.O. performance can suffer. That sounds a bit weary. Sorry about that. It's been a long running problem. Caching. Caching is interesting. Um, Caching shouldn't be, hide to use any, uh, shouldn't be used to hide any obvious shortcomings in your applications. Each app you make should be able to tolerate moderate web traffic, and caching should be a crowning glory to give users a really fast experience or to help you out during exceptionally heavy traffic, or both. And the art of persuasion. Um, how do we continue to make the case for building with open web standards? Five years ago, you might have said, Look, multi-page websites with semantic markup show up better in Google. Although now they'll apparently index any old shit with a hash bang. 
Today, you can use the iPhone and the iOS browser for similar purposes. Bosses these days care more for iOS than they do for Flash. But beware, the flip side of this, it can also mean that budget is more readily available for speculative Android and iOS app development than funds for standard-based web development. Ah, excuse me. So, um, another string to your bow, as it were, is um, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Now, um, pointy-haired bosses don't really take web standards necessarily as seriously as accessibility standards, but this one I like because it basically says, for F's sake, use web standards stupid in order to fulfill your accessibility uh, uh, obligations. So you can roll standards development into your accessibility work instead of just fobbing people off with a text alternative. And again, you may do a, proper, uh, a better job uh, of this than, than we managed. Usability. I just couldn't think of a picture to represent usability, so I just went for something with a handle. Is that all right? But usability, okay, so a lot of people will just say, um, say to you, you know, on podcasts and what have you, you know, just grab someone in the corridor, someone off the street or in a gallery to do some spontaneous usability testing. And if you can do that, great, but that is some awkward and embarrassing shit. Um, get some, you know, get someone to pay for it to be done properly. Go along and watch civilians try to use your website and then realise how stupid every assumption you've ever made is. And my final piece of advice, I give with a heavy heart, it will be familiar to many of you. Stay hungry. <coughs> Stay peckish. And moving on, I'd just like to introduce you another object story. And this is a reliquary cross from 10th century England. There's a walrus tusk ivory carving on the front. And the cross itself is made from gold and enamel. Now, some of the museum boffins have been researching a book on medieval ivories, and so we've got some decent pictures of this object. And the back of the carving of the Christ figure has a groove in it, um, because it fits over its contents. And what you'll see here, embedded in the back of the cross, is not a Nicaraguan cigar. It is a mummified finger, purportedly that of Mary Magdalene herself. So, the real thought I want to leave you with is this. Despite papal disapproval of the dismemberment of saints, a finger relic was by no means uncommon in Anglo-Saxon England. Thank you for listening. <laughs> um, yeah. Most of these slides are horribly copyrighted, um, but some of them are not. I put the URLs on each of them, so um, if you wrote them down quick enough, you can go and check. Um, and, and I can give you, a, uh, I can put it on your thumb drive if you like. Uh, so that's me. I, uh, I'm Rich BS. Uh, I've been working on the website. My co-developer is uh, a chap called John Stephen, who's very fine and tall. And um, the uh, another uh, perpetrator of this website was a chap called Richard Morgan, who is now working with Dave Vittori at the sister company of Squiz and uh, the artist, artist formerly known as Richard Morgan. So my thanks to all of them for being such great colleagues. Um, now that's about 33 minutes. Um, so I was just wondering, any feedback or questions or uh, would anybody like to express an opinion? So the Star Wars t-shirt there. It's a cat picture in the DNA. The, 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 the log. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's on my, it's, I could print it out and put it in there. So just leave it on a bench just, or something. Just put it on the website tomorrow. <laughs> Oh, no, no. I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, you've probably got a login, haven't you? Yeah. Uh, brilliant. Um, uh, no, it's not accession to the collection yet, but I do believe it to be a masterpiece, and time will show that to be the case. Chap in the middle there. For a company that uses I across the board, how yeah. did you get buy-in to actually produce an API? Or that? Um, it seems like those two things are odd. So you've got a, a, a so you've got a, a company that uses IE, which is uh, the, the the IT infrastructure is basically quite traditional. And then we've released an API of all our data and, and getting that done. Well, the argument we've used is essentially that um, the API is not for everyone else necessarily. We use it ourselves first and foremost. 
so we use it to populate our website. Um, it's that when somebody asks me, why, 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 why are we doing having an API? I sort of say, well, you know, that's none of your business. It's a bit like saying, why do you have a database? Um, <laughs> the API is, 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 is a tool that we use to uh, move data around our sites, and we use it internally as well. So in the, in the galleries, there are these uh, sort of terminals with metal keyboards that children dribble on, and, and, you, and you can type in searches in there, and that, that actually uses our API as well. So it, it allows us to roll out our data to multiple apps, and we only have to update it in one place. So you've got like these 50 absolute crappy little PCs under the desks in the museum, and instead of having to go around each one to sort of you know, put some new data on there, you, it's actually polling the API over the network. And that kind of works in, in most cases. But there are some copyright issues and sometimes there are more high-res images that need to be in the interactives than, um, than they're on the website, but, but <coughs> it generally works. And that's generally how we've made the case for it. One more question. Yes, sir. Um, if everything is publicly paid for, yeah. have you open sourced any of the code that you've written? Well, that's a really good question. Now. Um, we have had have every intention of doing so. We've also open sourced a, a couple of front-end applications that use our um, a, a sort of, we've got a, a jQuery plugin essentially that uses our data that you can deploy on any website. So we're trying to do that. The issue with the code base is that we kind of made the API system. Um, I'm really happy to talk to people about sharing it with other museums, but it's not really in a state that I'd feel proud of um, you know, releasing it onto GitHub and saying this is writing a sort of documentation. But in principle, we're really happy to share it, and we have shared our code with other public institutions, as it were. Um, and I think, you know, given time, I'd like to get that really tightened up and make it a bit more of a sort of pluggable Django architecture and, and release it there. But a lot of the um, sort of database structure and API structure is very specific to our data models in the museum as well. Um, so it's about separating out, separating out the stuff that would be useful to other people. And I just need to get my ass in gear and do it. But I, I, do, I do believe it's a good question. Thank you. Um, any other criticisms, points of view? Um, not to say that that was a criticism. I think that's is, that is a good question. But you know, I can't have it all good, can I? No? Thank you so much for listening. I, I really appreciate being invited here. Thanks to Jim and Nick for having me. And thanks for Dave for laughing loudly. Um, that that's, that's really helps. Um, thank you.